Around the world, the spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to the Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford, and we welcome you today to the Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. We trust and pray that your day has already been blessed by the power, by the presence, and by the Spirit of our living God. We thank God that His power is so real. Luke 5, 17 says, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. We just did a little short series on that just some weeks ago and got a lot of response from the listeners, how that it spoke to their hearts, how it ministered to them about the power of the Lord being present to heal and minister to their lives and to their needs. And needless to say, that same presence is here today just as it was then. There were just a select dispensation of people that actually got to witness Jesus, the Son of God, as he walked the earth. And they had no idea or had the appreciation that they should have had in knowing his presence was there like it was So it is in life today. The presence of God is exactly where you are. I do want to make quick mention again of the DVDs for a love gift of $50. That's postage paid. We'll send out the DVD set, the DVD series. It'll bless your heart and life immensely. Ten DVDs in the set. So we feel like that's a very, very great blessing to those of you who are interested in receiving those. Also, our conference has already been rescheduled, trying to stay away from the word conference, but it slips out. So I apologize for that. Revival meeting, April the 16th through the 19th, 2020, Hickory Metro Convention Center. We've already secured the facilities for that date. And myself, uh, Steve Quell, Jimmy D. Smith, Russ Dizdar will be there and we'll be ministering to you. And I pray that you'll put that on your agenda and come and be a part of that. We probably will have this meeting there once a year, every year, and then we'll periodically look at other places and do two, if not three meetings throughout the year. Uh, But we've already rescheduled this. We'll be looking at two other venues, Rome, Georgia, and uh, Evansville, Indiana. And I hope you will avail yourself to these meetings, these revival meetings. Uh, They are a great, great, great blessing, not only to me, but the opportunity to be with like-minded people, uh, to meet you, to shake your hand and hug your neck and uh, see who you are, uh, because there's so many of you out there who listen to us and support us. And for that, we are profusely humbled and thankful and grateful. We've been doing a series, The Depravity of Man. The depravity of man. Needless to say, man is man is so depraved it begs description. And we witness it every day in the lives and lifestyles of people. They're very, very sinful. They're very debased, to say the least. The least. But the depravity of man. The depravity of man. What a depraved creature man is. We want to pick up today in Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. That form of doctrine which was delivered you. First of all, before Christ comes into anyone's heart, into anyone's life, they previously were servants of sin, servants of sin. But because of obedience from the heart, that form of true doctrine true doctrine. What is the true doctrine? The true doctrine, the true form of doctrine 
speaks of the cross of Christ and his obedience unto death. Because of Christ's obedience and obedient even unto the death of the cross, we are able to be delivered. We are able to be made free from sin. Sin. It's a very small word, only a three-letter word, but a word of absolute total bondage. Sin holds men in utter captivity. Paul says, but God be thanked. We all should be thankful for what God has done in our lives. Every one of us should be thankful. I know I'm thankful. I know if it wasn't for the grace of God, I would not be here today. You, you can't live the lifestyle, the recklessness, the contempt for life in general, and not come forth unscathed. You will be hurt. You will be hindered. You will be harmed in some capacity if you remain in sin. Don't think you can live in perpetual sin and it not cost you something. You've heard me make the statement about sin. It will cost you more than you want to pay. It will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. Think about that. Sin will keep you longer than you wanted to stay. You say, well, I, I, did, I didn't mean to stay that long. And last but not least, sin will take you further than you ever wanted to go. That's why it's called temptation. It's, a, it, it, it's tempting. It's luring. It, it, sin draws men in. But if you could see beyond the veil of sin, the damage, the rot, the ruin, the chaos, every one of us would abhor sin and never dabble or deal or tamper with sin in any capacity. But Satan never shows men the wages of sin the retribution, the reward of sin. Satan will never show anyone the wages of sin. They've got several cancer ads and they show women, their larynx, their voice is gone. Half of their face, jawbone has been cut out. Smoking cancer they got another one about a guy uh, he's a member of the zipper club he's had heart problems and had his one of his lungs removed and he said he said smoking will get you one way or the other i never thought it would get me he said but it got me you see do you think satan is going to show you that no he's going to show you how cool how cool and how suave sin is. He's not going to show you the deformed face and neck of people who have had cancer and had been cut away. There was a, a baseball player who chewed tobacco, and I don't know his name. I don't remember his name, but he had so much of his jawbone taken out. He looked so deformed, part of his face. And he would go around and travel at high schools, and speak to young baseball players in high school, junior high, and say, this is the results of tobacco. Now, I'm not here to condemn you if you smoke or you chew tobacco or whatever the case might be. It's, it's a bad habit. It is a, an addicting. It's an addiction. It controls your life. And for that, I have empathy and sympathy for you. Some people are predisposed to addiction than other people. 
That's why some people can smoke meth, crack, and bam, they're addicted. Uh, Like Donald Trump, his brother Fred died of alcoholism. And he was asked once, do you think you have that gene in you, Donald? He said, we're never going to find out. It's hard to believe that man is 72 years of age and never so much as drank a glass of wine. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? I can't. But see, he has a fear of that element of sin. Other sins he doesn't have a fear of. But the point is, sin is controlling. All of us, before we were saved, we were the servants of sin. This is why obedience, obedience to the word of God brings deliverance. Paul says, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. That form of doctrine, Paul says, is what delivers you. Now, the form, the the epitome of the form of doctrine is the doctrine of the cross. 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The cross is the power of God, nothing else. I want you to understand, if your faith is in anything than the cross, your faith is misplaced. You're believing in something that will not save you, forgive you, or redeem you. Your faith must be in the cross of Christ. Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. This was the blood of a king. This wasn't the blood of another turtle dove, a goat, or a ram, bullock. This was the blood of a king because he was conceived by and through the Holy Spirit. There was no contamination in his blood. When we are born, we are already contaminated with sin. You've heard me use this analogy many times. You walk in the kitchen, you see a child with chocolate chip cookies all over his face. The chocolate chips have melted. And you say, have you been in the cookie jar? No, I've not been in the cookie jar. How did they know to lie? Did you set them down and teach them how to tell a lie? No. That's the sin nature. That's the Adamic nature that's already there. They are predisposed to sin. Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child in the way he should go, and he will not depart from it. Predisposed. It's just in your loins. That's why you have to obey. That's why in 1 Samuel chapter 15, when Samuel is talking to Saul, he says to Saul, obedience is better than sacrifice. You didn't obey God's word. You even brought the king back. You're supposed to kill everything and everybody. Thus he said, obedience is better than sacrifice. So many people say, well, I I sacrificed this, I sacrificed that. The question is, have you obeyed? Have you obeyed? Romans 5 and 19, for as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Obedience. As a Christian, you must obey the word of God. You must come out from among the world. You must have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. Ephesians 5 11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of daughters, but rather reprove them. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with daughters? Paul says, you can't mix these two. 
2 Corinthians 6, 17, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. You have to cut yourself off from the world and the cares of this world. All, all of this boils back down again to obedience. Jesus, Paul said, was obedient even unto the death of the cross. Paul is magnifying. Paul was magnifying the greatness of Christ's obedience in Philippians 2 and 8. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now think about that. He became obedient unto death. Not only unto death, but by death through the cross. Death of the cross. Now, let's just pause for a moment. Think about obedience. Being found in fashion as a man. He was made. He was formed. He was fashioned just like you and I, except he did not have the sin nature, but he was just like you. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Jesus understands temptation and the gravity and the weightiness of sin and the temptation. He understands the full brunt when you're tempted. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. The word tempted there means to make one evil. Satan was trying to make Jesus Christ evil so God the Father would resist him. But he didn't succeed. Then Paul, having the great revelation of salvation, redemption, reconciliation, he says that Christ was found in the fashion of a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Now, that means he obeyed all the way into the taking of his life. He died. Then Paul emphasizes and elaborates and what's the word am I looking for? Exalted what he did on the cross, even the death of the cross. Philippians 2 8, even the death of the cross. He glorified, he magnified the death of the cross. Again, uh, 1 Corinthians 1 18, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. The power was in the cross by the shed blood, and what capped it off was the resurrection on the third day. So if your faith is in anything else, it's wrong. The reason Jesus was water baptized was, was symbolically showing his death, burial, and resurrection. When you get water baptized, you're identifying with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. That's what water does. It doesn't do anything else. It's a symbol. And that's all it can be. Who was our example? Jesus. What did Jesus do? He was baptized. Did Jesus have sin? I said, did Jesus have any kind of sin? No, he had no sin. See, we, we've twisted the meaning, the significance of water baptism. It's the newness of life. We are buried with him. We rise again with him in newness of life. I'm trying to think of the verse. Romans 6 and 5. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. What is that likeness? Water baptism. That's the likeness. That's the symbol. That's the similitude. If I can use that word, similitude. 
When you are baptized in water, you're saying, number one, I am identified with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Number two, my baptism symbolizes my death. I've died to sin in the world. My burial, when you're dead, you're buried. When I come up out of the water, I come up in newness of life. You're already born again before you're water baptized. Now, don't let nobody tell you anything different. That, 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 that is heresy. You get mad at me, uh, get angry with me, have nothing else to do with me. That's fine. That doesn't bother me because I know the truth. If water could save you, uh, you could baptize a drunk. But that's not what saves him. It's that form of doctrine which is the cross and Christ's death, even unto death, the death of the cross, Paul said. This is the key. This is the key. You have obeyed from the heart. Your heart, not your cardiovascular beating heart, but the spirit and the soul, the heart of man. Paul said, but God be thanked. God be thanked. Now, Jesus, Colossians 2, 8 says, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. When Jesus hung on the cross, he destroyed the power of Satan, of sin. He destroyed the power of death. Hebrews 2, 14, that through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. I said, uh, Colossians 2, 15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. I think I said 2, 8, it's 2, 15. 2, 8 says, beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the traditions of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. This is why men are not saved. Because they're doing things after the traditions of men, not after Christ. Jesus, again, Colossians 2.15, having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over the men. He made an open display of his power on the cross, dying for our sins, shedding his blood. And then the third day he was raised from the dead, sealing the deal. Sealing the deal. Hebrews 9, 16, 17. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. So for anyone's last will and testament to come to fruition, they must die. April the 7th. My mother-in-law passed away, and then on June the 21st, my wife's stepdad passed away. They have to die for their last will and testament to come into force. Let me quote it again. Hebrews 9, 16, 17, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity, it's, it's necessary, for where a testament is, it is also a necessity that men should die. You, you have to die for the testament to come to fruition. For a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. As long as someone is alive and has their right mind, they can rewrite their will every day. They could change it every day. Just bring an attorney in, say rewrite it. Bring another attorney in, rewrite it, rewrite it. That's why you. That's why you have to have, in, 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 in a testament, you have to have the original. A copy will not work in a court of law. Why? Because if it's a copy, there could always be another new will written that is the original. So you can't present a copy in a court of law. You have to have the true 
last will and testament, the, the original. Jesus died to bring the New Testament covenant into fruition. Here's what's so great. Not only did he die to make it come to pass, he came back to live and to enforce it. Now, Jesus knew his death was temporal. He knew when he died, he was coming back. Do you know that? Do you know that? Jesus died knowing he would return. He, he was certitude. He had absolute confidence he would come and he would be raised again. How do we know? John 2.19, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Again, I'll bring my body back up. He told Pilate, he said, no man takes my life. I'll lay it down. I'll raise it up. He died knowing he would come back to life. He would come back and walk this earth again. Now, let's get back to this phrase. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. That form that form of doctrine whereto ye were delivered. The power of the doctrine of the cross. Jesus said in John 7, 16, my doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. Sin. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, Paul said, thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. I know, just like Christ knew, he would die, he would be raised again the third day. I know in whom I have believed. I've put my faith, I've put my trust in what Jesus did on the cross. There's nothing I can do to save myself. Do you realize the liberty that gives men when they embrace that? I don't have to do anything but believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that God hath raised Jesus from the dead and I'm saved. That's all I got to do. That's all I've got to do. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 says that if thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's all it takes to be saved. You have to believe. You have to believe and you have to confess it with your mouth. Now again, I'm going to use the thief on the cross. Listening to what he said, we could say, well, I don't see where he repented. But in his own way, his own words, Jesus understood exactly what he was saying. That's why I'm so glad he's the judge. You have people running around, you're not saved. Why am I not saved? You didn't go by this formula. You didn't go by this way. That's silly. That's demagoguery. You, you set yourself up as a God to judge people's eternal destiny if they haven't gone the method you think they ought to go? I'll tell you who's a, a beautiful testimony. Apollos. Acts chapter 18. Listen to this. This is going to upset some of you. <laughs> That's my job to upset you because you're wrong. And if you weren't wrong, you wouldn't get upset. But because you're wrong, what I say upset you. That's how I know you're wrong because you get upset with me. Listen to this. Acts 18 and 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. Mighty in the scriptures. Don't forget that. Mighty man of God. Why? Because he was in the scriptures. 
verse 25, Acts 18, 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and he taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. You mean he didn't know anything about the baptism of the Holy Ghost? That's right. Didn't know one thing about it. All he knew about was the baptism of John the Baptist. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom after Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Now, you're going to run around here and tell me Apollos was not saved because he wasn't baptized in Jesus' name? When the Bible, now watch this now, he was fervent in the spirit, not fervent in his spirit. It didn't say he was fervent in his spirit. It said he was fervent in the spirit. We're talking about God's spirit now. Oh, well, he wasn't saved. Ah, oh, there you are. You judge the man. He was fervent in the spirit and he spoke the word of God. He spoke the word of God eloquently. He was mighty, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures. Again, how do you reconcile that if you're an honest person? How do you do it? How do you do it? Well, you can't. This is why I preach so much Bible because there is a famine of the word. People don't get the word. They, they don't get hardly anything anymore. You know, I, I wouldn't know what I know if I didn't bathe my mind and study the scriptures daily. I mean, I don't know hardly of a day. You can ask my wife, if you think I'm lying or exaggerating, ask my wife how much time I spend in the Bible. When I'm at home, I'm working. How, how are you working? I'm working in the scriptures. You walk in my office right now at the house, and there's one, two, three, four, five, six Bibles on my desk. Six Bibles on my desk. Six. Isn't one enough? I'm a student of the Word of God. You see, people will tell you something, then I throw a passage out there and I say, now reconcile with what you're teaching with this passage, just like Apollos. Reconcile, he was eloquent and mighty in the Scriptures, and he was fervent in the Spirit. But all he knew was John the Baptist's baptism. You've been duped. I don't say that to castigate any denomination, any faction, any organization. I say that because they're wrong. Well, who are you? Nobody. Why do you do that? Because it's the Bible. And I am like Samuel. I, I'm supposed to teach you the right and the perfect way. Now, there are things that I read. They get me too. There's things I read in the scriptures that chastise me in a different way. Things that I need to improve, things I need to work on in my own life. Has nothing to do with sin. Has everything to do with truth. Truth. 1 Samuel 12 and 23. Moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you, and I will teach you the right or the good and the right way. My job is to teach you the good and the right way. And of course, I'm to pray for you. God forbid that I should sin against the Lord and ceasing to pray for you, and I will teach you the good and the right way. If you're not in the scriptures, and I'm, and I'm not just talking about a particular book. I'm not, I'm not into, you know, 
God just called me to be a faith preacher. God just called me to be a prophecy teacher. God just called me to be a money preacher. Uh, I'm anointed to raise money. That, 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 that's so silly. And I, you've heard that. I've heard that garbage. Paul said, I did not shun to declare unto you the whole counsel of God. The whole counsel, the entire counsel of God. What do we have today? We got men who will not teach you the entire counsel of God. Why? Why won't they teach you the entire counsel of God? Number one, they don't know it. Number two, if they were to teach the entire counsel of God, they would be chastened by the same Holy Spirit, by the same word of God. But we live in a day, we live in an era when men fail to preach the entire counsel of God. Paul said, I withheld nothing. That's why the Pauline epistles, they're, they're doctrinal. The gospels is for all the, all, all, everyone. Go you into all the world and preach the gospel. After a person gets saved, now we start addressing doctrine. We start addressing biblical truths that, that we need greater understanding, greater depth, greater knowledge, that we can grow in grace and in knowledge. Peter didn't say grow in the knowledge of your denomination, grow in the knowledge of your organization. No, 2 Peter 3.18 says grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You're to grow in Jesus. See? Doctrine. Christ represents all true doctrine. If it's not Christ, then it's not true doctrine. Now, there are those who will twist the scriptures and say, now this is this is this is the what that means. But then I'll pull out another verse and say, now make that verse reconcile with that verse, and they say, Well, no, we're not gonna do that. Just like there in Acts chapter 18. How are you going to say that Apollos was not a Christian? How can you say that Apollos was not? He was a preacher. Fervent in the spirit, eloquent in the scriptures, powerful man of God. But all he knew was John's baptism. But he wasn't saved. There you go. There's your self-righteousness. See, the truth is you're wrong, but you won't admit it. The greatest liberty I ever had was when I stood in the pulpit back in 1994, 95. That's been 24, 25 years ago. And I stood up in the, on Sunday morning. I said, folks, I was wrong about the pre-tribulation rapture. I was taught wrong. I was wrong. But I'm going to teach you the right, the good, and right way. See, when, when you're willing to admit your error, that's what sets you free. People don't understand bondage. How do I get free from addiction? How do I get free from a bondage? You have to acknowledge the truth. You hear, you've heard that statement about an alcoholic. He cannot get help until he admits he's got a problem. You cannot get free from denominationalism, false doctrine, false teaching until you admit I was wrong. Now, your denomination will browbeat you into subjection or they'll throw your little butt out. Yeah, I know. <laughs> they throwed my, or tried to throw me out, but they couldn't. God, see, God wouldn't let me become humiliated. So in the end, I gave them my ordination papers. See? And some of you, because you're in a denomination, you don't want to lose your clout. You're going to stay there and keep embracing a lie. Um, if you remember some weeks ago, I shared a YouTube video, and I, I read some letters, and how the one pastor told the other minister, well, we, we've, we've taken in too many members to change now, though he knows the pre-trib is a lie. That's why God spoke to my heart years ago. He said, I never let you get in the system where you could have gotten 
if my hand wasn't on you. Because if I had let you go and got on these committees and boards and stuff, you would have been compromised to the truth because you can't say it for political correctness, and I couldn't show you these things. So I had to keep you out. Then in the ultimate end, he took me all the way out. He said, because your ministry would have died and withered away. See, there are churches that won't use me all because I don't believe the lies. They won't use me. I really don't care because God's blessing the voice of evangelism because we're preaching the truth. If you, if you think I'm hurting or suffering because I'm not in your church, you're the one that's hurting and suffering because you won't let go of the lies. You keep holding on to the falsehood. That's a sin. James says, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is what? To him it is a sin. You got to come out of the harlot church, friend. Well, I don't want to leave all my buddies. So you love them more than you love God. Matthew 10, 37. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it, but he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. So you love your denomination or that particular brotherhood more than you love God. James 4, 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. I had no problem leaving. How can you say that? Because I'm not trying to climb the ladder of success. I, 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 I don't care. Now, I don't say that with disdain or with utter contempt. I just don't care. I'm trying to chase and follow and serve Jesus, the Lord's Christ. He and he only. Nobody else. Who you who you running after? Who you running after? Who's are you are you a member of an organization? Can anybody show me membership in the book of Acts where they joined a church? The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Who adds to the church? The Lord. You say, well, I'm a member of the Baptist denomination. So, you think that has something to do with salvation? We're the only ones that have the truth. Oh, you're an elitist. You're a Pharisee. You're a bigot. You're self-righteous. You don't have all the truth. Because you don't have the truth because you don't reconcile the scriptures. When men fail to rec reconcile the Bible correctly, that's how you get into error. Now, there'd be those to tell you today, Apollos was not even saved. Yet he was mighty in the scriptures. He was eloquent and he was fervent in, and I want to emphasize this, he was fervent in the spirit. But all he knew was John the Baptist's baptism. You say, Pastor, you offend me. I'm not offending you. If that Bible verse that I gave you right there at Acts 18, chapter 18, verses 24, 25, and 26, if that offends you, don't take it up with me. <laughs> take it up with the Lord. Tell him you don't like that. You don't, you don't like that now we've been 40, 50, 60 years after Pentecost, and you got people like Apollos. You got the group of Ephesians in Acts 19 who they believed, but they hadn't been baptized in Jesus' name yet. They were baptized under John the Baptist's ministry, but they were still saved. True doctrine. True doctrine is what sets men free. False doctrine brings men into bondage. False doctrine brings men into bondage. True doctrine sets men free. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine whereto ye were delivered. What does it mean to be delivered? To be delivered from sin, to be delivered from error, to be delivered from any kind of bondage. That's what Jesus does. Romans 
Romans 5, verse 14. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sent after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. You see, because death had superiority, Jesus had to conquer it. Death is, is, death is an entity. Death only came to fruition because of sin. Adam and Eve was to never die. Adam and Eve was to have never died. But because they sinned, now death entered into the world. Now, I'm not a theologian. I've never bothered to study where death came from. But I know death came from sin. Because once Adam and Eve sinned, death now entered into the world. Jesus knew what would happen if they partook of the fruit. And the day that ye eat, ye shall surely die. Obviously, death, in some degree, and again, I'm getting out here on thin ice, and was a reality or because of Adam and Eve's sin, it brought death to fruition. It, it brought it, this is a poor choice of words, it, death was brought to life. By the act of sin. Now that's a, that's a dichotomy. That it's an oxymoron. Death brought to life. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because Adam's sin, death came into the world. Galatians, uh, Romans 5 and 21. Romans 5 and 21. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Adam's sin, it's, it's as though, again, I can't explain it. It's, it's as though death was in existence or it was not in existence and it came to existence. It came to fruition because of sin. Sin brought forth death. That's why we must die again and not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. Because if you die with sin in your body, you die lost. I know that's a lot to comprehend. It's a lot to grasp. But because of Adam, sin entered into the world. Romans 5 and 12. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Now, Getting back to my point, was death already in existence or did death come to fruition? Did sin bring forth death? That's what I believe happened. Sin. Sin brings forth death. Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Sin, when it is finished, brings forth death. This is why you don't want sin in your life. This is why you don't want sin in your life. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, excuse me, 1 Corinthians 15, 55, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is of the law. But thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. Death entered into the world because of Adam's sin. Again, was death already in existence, or did sin bring death to life? 
to a reality, to a realization. I know that's an oxymoron. Death to life. Death to life. Was was death, death already there? We know death is an entity. How do we know death is an entity? We know death is an entity by Revelation chapter uh, 5. Because what, what do we see when once the seals, uh, Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse 8, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. Death and hell both are capitalized there, and they are entities. They are entities. They are beings of sort. Death and hell. I, I, this, is, this is what I believe. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm adamant and I'm absolutely right. But I believe when Adam and Eve sinned, they brought forth death. Death was not in existence per se. It had no power because it says that through death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Hebrews 2.14, talking about Jesus. That through death, his death, he destroyed him that had the power of death. That is the devil. I'll let you study that, search that out. When did death, when did death come to fruition? When did death enter into the world? Death entered into the world when Adam and Eve sinned and transgressed against God. It came to fruition. It came on all of us. It came on all of us. And thus, because of that, God had to drive man from the Garden of Eden, lest he partake of the tree of life and live under the power of death eternally. That's why Psalms 116 verse 15 says, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. See, in, in that context, death is a blessing. How would you like to live eternally with dementia, Parkinson's disease, psychosis, cancer, diabetes, uh, whatever, Lou Gehrig's disease? How would you like to, to live like that for eternity? No one would like to live like that. So what does Christ do? Because of death, and this is, this is the physical death now. Men die. But they're still subject to eternal death if they're not redeemed. Now they become redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And men are eternally exempt from spiritual death. Free for all eternity from spiritual death. Never mind the physical death. Because of one man's disobedience... Death entered in. Because of Christ's obedience, we have power over it. Not in ourselves, but through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. I pray you're getting a real grasp, a real understanding of the depravity of man and his humanity. His humanity. Because of man's death in the garden, Spiritually, Christ had to be formed, literally, conceived by the Holy Spirit, come into the world, die a natural death, be the sacrifice for man's sins, and atone for our sins, and then pass on to you and I through the new birth, eternal life, where death can no longer reign in these bodies. And we're going to have a new body a glorified body like Christ the Lord. God bless you. Have a great week. I'll see you next week in the Lord the Jesus Voice Christ. Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to the Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to the Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.